Well, by now it should be obvious to everyone that Republican presidential candidate and frontrunner Donald Trump is not afraid of controversy from his statements about killing ISIS family members to his proposed policy of not allowing Syrian refugees into the country. Donald Trump has managed to, well, not only take on delicate issues head on, but his refusal for political correctness has only made him stronger and more popular among his supporters. And as of right now, I mean, Donald Trump still has a commanding lead over the rest of the GOP candidates, as many Americans see him as anti-establishment. Well, I don't know about all that, but one thing's for sure, regardless of what you think about Trump, he is talking about subjects and bringing up topics that, well, to be honest, the rest of the candidates are afraid to talk about. Case in point, the GOP debate the other night, Donald Trump exposed how George W. Bush helped the bin Ladens escape after 9-11. Remember, all commercial and private airline traffic was shut down after the attacks on September 11th. But the Bush White House, they approved planes to pick up members of the bin Laden family. They actually flew them out of the country, and this was before they could be detained or even questioned. Again, this was when no one was allowed to fly under any circumstances. When you had the World Trade Center go, people were put into planes that were friends, family, girlfriends, and they were put into planes and they were sent back for the most part to Saudi Arabia. That's right, there you go. Once again, we hear about Saudi Arabia, whose government and members of the Saudi royal family helped finance and train the 9-11 hijackers. Google search the 28 pages. And it turns out that not only did Bush smuggle the bin Ladens out of the country, but also several suspects from Saudi Arabia. Six private jets, two dozen commercial airliners carried a total of 142 Saudis and 24 members of the bin Laden family out of the United States. Again, this is while all other airline traffic was grounded. By the way, a good book on this subject, House of Bush, House of Saad by Craig Unger goes into much more detail. And I'll never forget watching an interview with former head of the visa department in Saudi Arabia, Michael Springman, who became a whistleblower when he witnessed the U.S. government take part in covert operations to funnel in and protect Islamic terrorists as far back as 1987. And he thinks that the 9-11 hijackers were CIA assets and they were brought through knowing that they would be protected by the agency. Well, it began in Jeddah when I was repeatedly told to issue visas to unqualified applicants. This went on for quite some time during most of my tour there. Under the American immigration laws, you need to demonstrate that you're going to the United States for a specific purpose. And typically, uh, in such a situation, you're going to sign a business deal, or you're going to go as a tourist to see the Grand Canyon, or you're going to the United States as a, as a student to study a particular course of study. And these were people that uh, had no job in one instance. He was a Sudanese uh, who was unemployed in Saudi Arabia and a refugee from the Sudan. But he got a visa for national security purposes after it was taken out of my hands by the chief of the consular section. At basis, though, I really think that these were more CIA assets, people that were recruited, like uh, all of the folks I've been issuing visas to a couple of years previously. And uh, these people uh, were tools to be done for a job. Well, the visas issued to the hijackers in Jeddah uh, came about as a result of it being a CIA consulate. It was the fifth largest visa issuing post in the Middle East. Uh, it was pretty much a, a closed system, and they simply brought them through there, and knowing that they would be protected by the agency, that people would uh, get their visas, or if they didn't get the visas, they could be made to be given visas. 
once I got back to the United States and was out of the Foreign Service, I ran across a couple of people with ties to the American government uh, that told me another story, that the CIA was recruiting fighters for the Afghan war against the then Soviets and that their asset Osama bin Laden was working with them. In the early 1980s, bin Laden worked with operatives from U.S. intelligence, the Pakistani military, and Arab states. They ran a wide-ranging covert network that recruited and financed Muslim fighters to battle the Soviet army. And it is now known that the boogeyman, Osama bin Laden, well, he was indeed a CIA asset, and he went by the name of Tim Osman whenever he traveled to the United States. The relationship between bin Laden and the CIA uh, was essentially, uh, he was one of the assets, one of the people they could turn to for help if they had questions. If they wanted somebody recruited, if they wanted somebody sent somewhere, if they wanted information, if they wanted something done, they went to bin Laden. Bin Laden isn't wanted by the FBI, and he was on a CIA payroll? Is he the brutal Islamic terrorist we have been led to believe? So we know that before 9-11, radical Muslim terrorists were allowed visas into the United States. And for whatever reason, they were protected by the CIA. So what's the visa department up to these days? Well, unfortunately, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And Michael Springman joins us now to talk about the current U.S. visa policy. And I wanted to ask you about foreign contractors, because I'm hearing that a lot of these guys are basically able to sell a ticket to America to the highest bidder. How dangerous is that? Well, that is pretty creepy. Uh, I am not an entire expert on that, but I do know that the State Department has farmed out a lot of its payments uh, for visas and a lot of his investigatory work. Um, and this is absolutely amazing. Uh, they claim it's to reduce the workload on the consular officer. But when I was in Jeddah, I interviewed 100, 200 people a day. And I didn't have this problem. Uh, they filled out a piece of paper with two sides on it. And uh, I had a two hour, two minute interview with them. And now, if you want to get a visa from the United States, uh, you get a personal application, four pages uh, on the internet with the, the local foreign service post, answering all kinds of questions about your background, including your parents' names and, and addresses. And uh, then you get a, a personal interview. And uh, after that, uh, you still get uh, subjected to uh, all sorts of investigation and um, uh, controls on uh, who you are, where you're going, and, and so forth. It's, it's not an easy, simple process anymore. Uh, the prices have gone sky high, and uh, you're limited in the number of applications you can make in a year. Well, let's talk about the San Bernardino shooters. You know, one of the terrorists was Tashfeen Malik. And she was one of the radical Muslims who carried out the attacks in San Bernardino. She was approved for a K-1 fiancé visa by the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad, Pakistan, even though she had a history of involvement with radical jihadist groups in Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, not to mention her participation in several jihadist-oriented social media sites. So why was it so simple for her to get into the country? Uh, I believe that she had help from the American government because yeah. by law and regulation, and in fact, as set forth on uh, the embassy in Islamabad's website, uh, if you uh, spend more than six months in a country over the age of 16, you need to have a police report from that country as part of your application package. She had spent time in Saudi Arabia and should have had a police certificate. Uh, additionally, uh, according to the website and the State Department's own paperwork, if you are married, even in a Muslim contract marriage that is not consummated, you cannot get a K-1 fiancé visa. Your uh, spouse in the United States has to produce a immigrant visa petition and a, apply for a K-3 spousal visa. And my understanding from reading the news reports was that she had been married in Saudi Arabia uh, and that uh, she never produced that information, which was registered with the Saudi government. 
And somehow she avoided having to produce a police certificate, even though that was required by the embassy in Islamabad. Well, let me ask you this. Just when you thought Obama's America couldn't get any more politically correct, I heard that immigration officials are now prohibited from looking at visa applicants' social media. What's up with that? Well, I, I can see perhaps the immigration officials doing that, but the people who do the real looking are the Central Intelligence Agency and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And as far as I know, they can pretty much do as they please. Uh, this business of uh, uh, these people slipping through somehow uh, is a bit uh, hard to take because they were fingerprinted. And in case the woman was, she had to be fingerprinted for her K visa, for which she was not qualified. And when she became a permanent resident in the United States, she was again fingerprinted and investigated by the FBI and by the CIA. I once had a Pakistani Muslim client whose horrible crime was to be in a uh, federal park after closing hours, and he paid a $40 ticket, and this followed him all the way through to application for permanent residence and application for citizenship. I mean, he was uh, watched and watched and investigated until the cows came home, and we couldn't do a thing about it except finally I began threatening lawsuits against the federal government, and suddenly uh, it became a lot better. So I guess what it boils down to is that there is a vetting process by the, the average, your, your average immigration official and, and visa applicants, they go through this and look at everything as much as they can, but the federal government is the one that are letting these potential terrorists into the country? Yeah, I mean, it's the federal government uh, is behind it. The immigration is a federal issue, and the United States government has complete control over this stuff. Uh, they... Uh, have legal attaches abroad in most embassies. Uh, they have a CIA station in uh, every embassy, plus a number of bases and consulates, uh, so that uh, these people do a lot of checking and double checking and rechecking. So this this business of well, we didn't know, we couldn't find out that she what she posted on Facebook. Uh, I've never seen anything stop the CIA from doing what it pleases. That's right. Well, more proof that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Thank you, Michael Springman. All right, thank you for having me on. All right, here's the thing. Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson says that it would be bad for public relations if immigration officials were to review social media posts by foreigners applying for visas. This is Twilight Zone level insanity. I mean, if I was a manager at McDonald's and I wanted to hire a guy to serve French fries at the drive-thru, you can bet your ass that I'd probably check out his Facebook page before I decided to hire him. But yet in today's Obamaville, USA, they are more concerned about a civil liberty backlash than they are about protecting our nation from terrorists. Unbelievable.